Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you so much for attending our session uh, called Growing Up the Product Management Tree. My name is Debbie Wren. I'm an Agile coach with JP Morgan. Um, I've been with JP Morgan roughly about 14 months, and prior towards that, I worked um, for a number of different consulting companies, um, including Tata Consultancy. So here in, in India, I have done a lot of work previously. Um, and today, we're going to talk about growing up the product management tree. Uh, but I'd like to introduce my colleague here. Hey, I'm Ashish Medhirata. I'm also the Agile coach here in JP Morgan. I've uh, been here with the firm for almost a year and a half now. So yeah, enjoying myself. So as you can imagine, JP Morgan, large organization, typical trials and tribulations in terms of building product, um, keeps us very busy, as you can well imagine. Uh, before we get going, though, I'd like to just gauge where people are in terms of uh, scrum and product ownership. So just a raise of hands would help enormously. Um, those of you who are brand new to Scrum. Okay, no one, that's good. Uh, those of you who are using Scrum, so roughly bleh, anything two, two plus years. A member of a Scrum team. Okay, and anybody in the room who's a product owner? Nice, okay. All right, so we're going to talk a lot about product ownership today and certainly pull on uh, Ashish and my collective experiences in our journey to date with the transformation efforts at JP Morgan, but also to pull from our collective previous experiences in other organizations to show you how product development has changed over the years and some of the challenges that we've faced and some of the things we've put in place to try and counteract the issues that we, we, we uh, come across. All right, so first of all, I wanted to just remind us of our ag agile values, um, which of course go together with the, the principles, the 12 principles that we have. And really, as we look at product ownership and have a look at how it's grown up over the years, the past decade, um, we've pretty much moved away from or are trying to move away from a distinct area in an organization who remains totally detached from where the value is created, i.e. in our, our development um, technology groups. And I guess, you know, as I look at my experience over the years, that's where I've seen significant change happen. We're moving away and getting closer and closer to our development teams. That's what we're aspiring to. And those of you who've attended a number of the keynote sessions and indeed some of the other breakout sessions have heard a lot about product ownership and engagement of product owner or the, the, the owner of the, of the vision and the requirements. But... As I look at the Agile uh, values, the one that stands out for me the most, and probably is the one that's the most misunderstood, uh, principally because people believe that that's just a value in, for an organization who has a customer-vendor relationship, is, is value number three, which is around customer collaboration over contract negotiation. And it doesn't mean commercial contracts at all. That's not where it's coming, coming in from at all. And that's a misunderstanding that we've certainly experienced, um, not the least where we work currently, but in previous organizations. And really where this value is talking to is in order for us to get close to where the value is being created by our development teams, as product owners, um, we need to be able to have sensible conversations without playing the contract game. And those of you who've been in large organizations know that they um, organizationally are structured to encourage that sort of behavior. Um, you, you, know, you, you, you try and come up and define a, a bunch of requirements. Um, we fix some arbitrary date and time when those requirements have to be delivered by. The specification is frozen. And then we go through the cycle of the business wanting more to be added to the product and the dev team's going less. And then we stick in the cycle of more, 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 less, 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 and the contract game starts. With product ownership, uh, it's essential that we start to break those barriers down and we move forward in a partnership relationship. And if I look at any aspect of moving towards an agile way of working, regardless of the framework we apply, that's probably the hardest part of it. 
it really is hard because not only are we encouraging close collaborative working, we also, if you look from a technology group, is we're trying to undo a lot of behavior that's been entrenched in the organization for years and years and years, i.e., you know, We've given you the requirements. You know what we, you need to build. Go away, build it, and we'll whine when you deliver the wrong thing. Um, and that's classically what happens. If we look at the role of a product owner, uh, certainly as, as we look at Scrum, for instance, and we look at the definition carefully, it actually is a pretty lonely job. When I was trying to match up some graphics to go with the wording, this kind of struck me as being one that more or less epitomizes how I see a product owner. Your product owner is really someone who um, has deep domain knowledge. Uh, they also are very much in touch with our customers. They actually do talk to customers and they interact with customers. And that in itself is tough. But those are the sorts of people that we need. If we're going to build, and we heard in the last session, build the right product right, we need to be in touch with who we're building our product for and what our product is. So that's an important part. Being in touch with our customer is absolutely important. Our product owner also has to really have the authority and the responsibility to make decisions. What we not looking for in a product owner is somebody who has been placed in that position but still has to go and ask their boss, who then has to go and ask another boss and another boss in order to get a decision made on prioritization. If I'm going to be taking on the role of product owner, I have that autonomy. I'm responsible to nobody else apart from being responsible to the product. I can make those calls and those decisions. And our product owner, uh, you know, if we lead on from that, should also own a very well-groomed backlog, a list of things that we want in our product, and, and absolutely understand what that product is made up of. Now, of course, some of the challenges that we're going to touch on is, well, what if our product is massive? How can our product owner possibly understand all of that? And we do have some tactics that you can put in place, some approaches you can use, to support your product owner. Okay, so we're going to look at some of the challenges. You know, here's my product owner going down this path of product ownership, some of the challenges that we face as being a product owner, and how we can overcome those. And certainly, we've seen all aspects of this in our journey so far to date um, inside the bank. Importantly, the one thing that we do want from our product owner, and again, where we have to work very hard at this, is close relationships. Not only in touch with our customer, but building very close relationships with the teams that the product owner actually should, who, who, who they should be directing. So our product owner in Scrum actually directs those teams. The teams are responsible to the product owner, and the product owner steers and directs them in terms of where the product has got to go. So to do that, we want a product owner who can be close to the teams, is not afraid to have a conversation, is willing, keen, and eager to participate in you know, the grooming, the backlog grooming activities, or product backlog refinement, as it's also known. We want our product owner to be all of those. And that takes you know, a lot of courage to do so. Okay. So very close relationships, um, both within, directly with the teams, and outside facing towards our customers. Principally, I, I talked about the backlog, well-groomed backlog. A backlog can't exist in isolation. It has to be not just a random list of thoughts that I've had on the train this morning, but it has to be well thought out. It has to be fundamentally prioritized. And that in itself is difficult. We've seen a number of, a couple of sessions today where prioritization has come up. Um, and, you know, atypically what you tend to get in organizations is you know, the business side of the partnership where the product ownership is currently sitting, um, prioritizing everything as must-haves. Now, everything is important. You know, guys, go build this. It's all important to us. And we know that that's not true. No two requirements are ever the same. Some are more equal than others. And prioritization, in order for us to understand as technology teams 
what we're required to build first is really, really important. But more importantly, making sure we're building the right stuff for the product. So building the, the right product right is, is the key thing. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about challenges around prioritizing. Um, you know, if I can relate back to a, a standout moment in my career where, where prioritization really hit home to a product group, um, I was working part of a, a large distributed um, um, global team. We had a product, a product owner, product manager at the time it was called, and they did exactly that. Everything was e exactly the same order, all must-haves. And we knew there were items on there that were less important than others. So one of my colleagues, who was a bit more braver than I was, because I was quite good in those days, until I grew up, um, he decided that actually to prove the point of how important it was for the product team to steer our development teams, he actually picked some, very, uh, some items off that backlog which were very low priority. He knew they were low priority, and he built them. And needless to say, when we came to demonstrating the product, of course, that's when the feedback came. But those weren't really the requirements we wanted to be delivered. We wanted these other ones delivered. Ah, but you told us that everything was equal. So we just, you know, we just picked whatever we wanted to pick. And that proved the point. Okay, so sometimes you have to uh, educate uh, your product owners in order to understand how important it is to do the activity of prioritization. Um, on whatever basis they choose to do it on, because there's many ways I can prioritize, but it is vital and important. And homing them and encouraging them to get towards, you know, what is the barest minimum we can get away with and add a lot of value to our customers? What do we need to release first and what can come second and what can come third? And again, because our, our, our classic product teams are, are quite greedy in terms of what they want, they want everything and we end up building a lot of features which are often are not used. And in fact, I have a, a good ex recent example where um, a product that's just uh, been launched fairly recently, in fact, probably about 40, 45% of the features are not currently being used. So we've probably invested a lot of time in building features which weren't necessary at that point in time. So prioritizing, um, and that's an activity which uh, certainly in our experience, our product owners have not been used to doing. And in order to be effective with, with Scrum and the scaling of Scrum, um, this is one of the areas we've had to work very hard in. Of course, our product owners being close and working very close to our teams, constant communication, face-to-face -face being the best, um, their job is to help clarify those items. So participating, as I said, uh, actively in product backlog grooming, uh, knowing the details of the things that they need to have, and not being afraid to recognize them when they get it wrong. And I have had a couple of product owners, um, certainly in my time at JP Morgan, who've actually gone, you know what, actually, yeah, we did get it wrong. You guys have built the right things, but we just didn't know what it was that we were looking for. And now we see it, uh, we know where we are. So that instant feedback helped them understand where they were, and they've learned from that, and now we can carry on clarifying those items. But clarification and making sure that your teams are clear before they actually enter into the, the, the sprinting process uh, is vital. And again, that's, that's all part of growing up as a, as a product owner, product manager. The one that we always hear a lot about during, you know, certainly during Scrum, and I hear our, uh, you know, a lot of our technology teams really hitting home hard in terms of, yes, we can't start work until you prioritize based upon business value. Okay? Now, you know, a part of it is the technology team's just been a bit lazy because they don't really know what business value means, but they've heard the words. But the other part is, is, is also very, very important and very subtle, and that is knowing how important all these items are so that I can actually pick the ones that are going to give me the biggest bang for my buck and make my customers delighted. And that's what we know as our MVP and the thing that we want to ship first in order to get the product out into market and used so that we can actually get the feedback. So when you're looking at your product owners and learning to grow your product owners and to uh, increase their level of understanding and maturity, Often, you know, as part of the coaching routine, we have to step in and help them understand really what business value means to them. 
Now, how they choose to quantify business value, that's purely down to them, but uh, in terms of understanding how important it is as part of the process, we have to help them do that. So that gives um, broadly more or less what we're looking for in product owners and product ownership. And interestingly, you know, we've, we've probably been, been through most of the challenge that you can possibly ever get with product owners. Um, and I, you know, I'd say as part of the, the leaving note when we, we leave the session later on, um, it requires a lot of patience with your product owners and a lot of help and attention. If there's one thing I can call out is when we've seen some of the sessions going through over the past couple of days, I've heard a lot about coaching and mentoring and help. But most of it's been aimed at the technology teams. We forget, actually, to really grow up, we have to help our, our, our business partners as well. And that's where we invest significant amounts of our time to help people understand and grow and learn. Yeah, I think all of you have now a fair idea of what a product ownership means and what we all are looking for, right? And when we work with teams, uh, that's what we are looking for, whether the person who's working with the team from the business side is exhibiting these characteristics, these traits, and how do we work and guide them towards these, uh, these traits, right? So some of the challenges that we find, and this is common across that we have seen, uh, like in the bank and in our earlier assignments also, uh, the product ownership is a new thing which came on uh, in the last decade, right? And, but earlier you had product managers, right? And you still have product managers, but the whole transformation for the product function to this new model, nobody has really given a big thought, right? There is always some bits and pieces you hear, but there's no concentrated effort to actually go ahead and give, give, give your love to this, this community, right? We, you saw the product owners are pretty lonely in this journey, right? They have this internal stakeholders now with the team. They already have the customers on their back and they have to grow the revenue and show it back to the business, right? So they're, they're already in this big whirlpool, right? And so, th so they need to uh, be supported by the team by all these stakeholders. So some of the challenges we find is that uh, the new role, the specifically let's say in the Scrum model, we find that the product ownership itself is not clearly defined as to what are the expectations. And you heard uh, say uh, you have to clarify, you have to prioritize, you have to show the business value and explain and give a shared understanding to the team, right? So I think some of the challenges we find is that the Product owners are not real, right? They are like what we call as fake product owners. So you'll find uh, R&D manager, probably if you're in a complex, big program, uh, so that guy is wearing the hat of a product owner. But, or you could find a, even a project manager. Sometimes there are business analysts who are playing the role of a product owner, right? But the question to ask is what we said, does that person have the capability to accept or reject your work item, right? When the team produces something, can he accept and reject it? Can he tie that work item to the business value, right? What is the business outcome is that work item giving it? Can he prioritize your backlog, right? Is he able to say, yeah, this piece of work, this functionality will go in this release one, and we'll build it over, and this new piece of functionality, which is like the meat, will go in the release too, right? So can he take that decision? So these are the questions you have to ask if you are saying I'm a product owner, right? So if you are not, then we say you are in a fake role, right? And that means that you can't really give us the direction or the team the direction that they need, right? And that leads to our, one of our next challenge, which is all about the so before yeah, we, we yeah. flick on to the Go next ahead. trial, I was just going to add in there, yeah. um, you know, in the bank we have a lot of fake product owners, yeah. and actually they are quite proud about that. Now why do I mean they're quite proud about that? They actually are happy to admit that they are probably in a very temporary position at this point in time in order to keep the wheels going. That doesn't mean to say that it's right, but they're happy to say, actually we understand the difference between a real product owner, i.e., 
the role that we, sh you know, somebody should be in, but we're just at the moment trying to keep the wheels going, and we are actually a fake product owner. We're making some choices and decisions, albeit in concert with our business partners, but actually we're fake product owners. And I think that's very important for you and for your uh, uh, business um, stakeholders who are engaging with you to make sure that they understand the difference between the two. And certainly Scrum is very specific about that. So don't call them real product owners if they're not real product owners. Rather, let them call themselves fake product owners while you actually make that next step for forward in, in your adoption of um, product ownership. Yeah. Uh, you, want, you have a question? Are we on? Yeah, go ahead. A scrum master be a fake product owner. Um, yeah, sure. Um, should a scrum master be a fake product owner? No. A scrum master should be the master of scrum, um, working with the teams to make sure that we keep honest with what we're doing as far as a scrum is concerned. Um, I've not seen a Scrum Master be a product owner, more the classic, you know, if I'm looking at the fake product ownership scenario, more classically a business analyst is put in that role, because that's the easiest thing to do. You know, I'm a product owner, I'm too busy, or I belong to the, the product group or the product team, I'm too busy, you know, business analysts, you take that role on, and we end up with a bit of layering that occurs between the real product owner and the actual teams via the fake product owner. Um, and all the challenges that that involves. So business analysts, uh, project managers often step into that role. Uh, development managers sometimes step into it. Um, I've not personally seen a scrum master and I'll actively discourage a scrum master to take that on. It means they can't pay their full attention to the teams and helping the team optimize their, their, um, their delivery capability. You're more welcome. So I think, let me, let me counteract on that and, and just give you some food for thought. Remember to ask a series of questions when you think that you are a product owner. And one of those is, am I, first of all, am I facing my customer and do I interact with my customer and, and engage with them on a day-by-day -day basis? Um, secondly, um, do I have the authority and responsibility to make choices about this product? without having to ask anybody else. And uh, certainly in my experience, project managers, yes, they may be responsible for the delivery of software or other aspects of the product, but they don't have that overall responsibility and authority. Somebody else is above them making those calls about the product. Somebody else is holding that vision and has a distinct vision about what this product really is all about. Okay, so let me just leave that one with you because think about that very carefully. There's a distinct difference between a product owner who's driving the vision forward and a project manager who's responsible for the delivery of software. Okay, and, and other aspects of that, that delivery out to a customer. So think about that. And actually do have a, you know, make very visible to your uh, business community the sets of questions that you can ask for them to check if they are a product owner. Okay, and that's very easy to do. Okay, but it's that authority and responsibility which is really, really important. Okay. Yeah, right. So I think this that, uh, challenge that you face, if you are in the situation where you have fake product owners, right, which is primarily the lack of trust, right? So now I have this business analyst who's talking to the team internally, and the business analyst then goes back to the product manager or the real product owner now, right? And then there's this maybe multiple layers even within that, right? Add to the fact that you have distributed teams, right? There are time zone challenges along with that. So now you have folks across the oceans talking to each other, right? 
and that brings in that whole element of communication, right? And rather miscommunication, wherein I tell you that this is what the customer needs and the customer is across the ocean and that's where the real product owner is and you have somebody here who's saying, yeah, this is what we understand, this is what you told us to deliver and we are delivering this, right? But actually what happens within that conversation, things tend to get lost, get distorted, right? So all the classic problems that you have end up creating a big gap, right? Big gap between the product side and the delivery side, right? So that's where this big challenge of trust and the trust is, which is the relationship that you saw early on, right, which is so crucial, tends to break down and the rift widens, right? The other thing uh, uh, is in terms of, as you have these challenges, right, the product management function has been, like I said early on, has been working in a certain model early, right? They've been, as a product manager, they've been used to the notion of, I'll come to the team once a year I'll tell them this is what the customer is looking for and throw it back that and I'll come after one year and ask what's, where's the software, how does it run, can I go back to my customers with it, right? So that mindset is required, shift is now required for us to say, yeah, in this new model where the teams are now asking for almost daily collaborative uh, discussion to clarify things, right, to help you prioritize things, right? So that's where the new function has to move, right? So the old habits, old habits have to change, right? Yeah, you want to add? For many voices. Okay, yeah, let's take a question. Can we get a mic? Yeah, yeah. anyway, you ask, we can repeat the question. So we're going to cover a little bit of that when we hit the solutions part, because it, it, precisely that. You know, we're too busy, we haven't got time, uh, we allocate you a, a, a fake product owner, you deal with them, they get busy and things get a bit hectic and, and chaotic. So if you just bear with us, we'll, we'll cover off that one with you as we get through. Yeah. So the other big challenge that we've seen across the board is, especially in large complex programs that we work with is, uh, there are so many voices, right? If I am a team member, right, and I have to deliver something every two weeks, I want clarity on what do I need to deliver, right? And you heard earlier we have so many techniques spec by example and so many other things are there now. But still, you get a person telling the team, do this activity, go in the direction north. Then there's, within the sprint, you'll find another person saying, go south, right? So there are so many voices for the team Again, that's, the team cannot give you a consistent, consist, consistent delivery outcome, right? And you will find even in large program that if you have multiple product owners, right, they may not be on the same page, right? They will have their own challenges in terms of which is the number one item among that big bucket list of 100 items, right, that the customer is asking, which one is the one that they should put in this upcoming release, right? So there, there are too many voices uh, across the board which needs to be channeled and for the team, what we are saying is you should have a single voice which the team should hear, right? So that's another big challenge. Yeah. We'll come to the solutions part of it, but that's primarily the whole out, 
landscape in terms of the challenges that we have seen, just to name a few. Yeah, yeah. There's a, I mean, there's a whole host more, but yeah. the, these are the ones that, if I uh, abstract them back up, these are the ones that, that constantly bubble to the surface. Um, some of the things that we've looked at in terms of overcoming these challenges uh, around our product ownership and product owners particularly, and that is not only make sure that we get the right product owner, but when we do have the product owner or even a, a fake product owner, is to empower them. That, that is very, very important. Give them the authority and the responsibility um, to be able to make choices and decisions. Even if that's delegated from the real product owner to a fake product owner, that's better. That's a, a first step forward in our journey of growing up. Making sure that whoever the team is interacting with doesn't have to now go through layers and layers and layers of um, hierarchy to get an answer that the team needs now. Um, we want to try and cut that down as, as much as we can in order to make progress forward. So treat them as a first-class citizen, empower them. Yeah, so the, one of the biggest challenges, like we said, was the distance or the time zone barriers, right? So one of the solutions we've found is that you've got to co-locate the product owner with the team. So that's the ideal way to go forward, right? Wherein you have your delivery team sitting next to the product owner so that they have constant interaction face to face, right? They're able to get feedback as the customer is talking to the product owner, you get input from the field, he's able to relate that back to the team and say, yeah, this is what we are hearing back from our customers, these are the pain points, let's work around it, let's make our customers happy. So that should be your number one way forward, right? But having said that, we do live in a world where distributed teams are a reality, right? So at least make sure that your del delivery teams are co-located, so that's the next step. You don't want a team which has two members in one continent and two members in the other continent, right? So you, re you really want to bridge that gap first to make sure at least the delivery team is all together in one room, in one workspace, and is able to hear and consistently hear the same voice and everybody has a shared understanding. So that way, the, again, it all comes down to reducing that communication gap, reducing those barriers, right? And even, even yeah. within the bank, we're, we're making moves towards, um, you know, if I look at India, for example, we're making moves towards moving responsibility for whole products into the region, rather than coping with the distributed nature of um, development that we've had up until now. Now, it's a slow process, but it's in motion, and that's what, we, that's what we're aiming towards. Um, as she said, you know, the ideal is having our product owner as close to the teams as we can. If you can't necessarily achieve that, because often our product owners are in North America or, or Europe, then at least find, uh, if the bus you know, your cooperations are out here in, in India, for example, then find subject matter experts in your operations areas who can actually provide local expertise to you. Um, so the teams can interact with real people who are actually using using the product and can get instant feedback that way. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't take away from the product ownership. That's still vital and important. But at least we're now getting closer interaction with the real business. Um, the shocking thing for me when I first started working with large organisations was that many of the team members I worked with didn't actually know what the operations people did. They had never actually taken time out to go have a look at what operations do, and actually sat down for a day and just looked at what the people were doing every day in order to better understand um, the problems they were experiencing. And that in itself is one of the steps that you can take, um, take now to help your teams get closer to the product so the product owner does actually have better conversations with them. This is probably, of all of them, one of the most vital to get right, and that is know your product. And as we start looking at the world of product ownership and growing up the world of product ownership, um, an application doesn't equate to a product. A product is something which is customer visible. Um, it's generally the thing that you're advertising to the outside world, that's your product. How you actually deliver that product is via obviously software and applications and components that make up that product. 
But the, a, a classic mistake that is made is that people focus on applications as being their product. Now, it that not, might be a case that it is, but in nine times out of 10, my experience shows me that it isn't. And actually having a product owner who understands totally what their product is and the domain that they're in is the second thing to get right. Um, you can't have a product owner who doesn't understand his product. Um, he needs to understand the vision, where it's headed, and he needs to understand where he wants to go with it. Um, now, if your product is large, one of the scaling tactics that you can put into play is um, by building a product team who support your product owner. Now, I don't mean, you know, we build large organizations like that, not at all, but your product owner needs some friends who can help him or her. And those friends have detailed knowledge about certain aspects of that product, and they can help the product owner make the choices and decisions. Yeah. And I think it all comes down to the fact that how do you build the teamwork, right? The teamwork required for us, for the business side and the technology delivery side, to work together, right? So how do you get them to build that trust to work as a single team, and that comes back to the original manifesto, right, where you are talking about the collaboration and not playing that contract game, right? You're not saying, I'll throw this over the wall to you, you've got to deliver, and the engineering team says, yeah, we'll do this, but this and that. So rather than that, you work on the collaborative aspect, probably using spec by example, or other techniques, wherein you're all in it together. How many times you might, have, might find product owners working with team and team saying, yeah, this is super easy. I have this widget I can re reuse from this library and I can spin it out for you in the next two weeks. Or you might find, yeah, we are working on this proprietary software which costs us millions of dollars as license, but if we move to this open source software which is vetted by our firm, we can save cost for you, right? So those are the conversations which help you, the overall product, right? And you can only have that conversation when you have Trust in each other, right? So, you want to take this one? Key all right. At the end, uh, the key takeaways for us with the challenges that we have seen treat your product owners as first class citizens. That's number one. You've got to empower them. Make sure you have real product owners, not fake product owners, right? Then make sure when you have that product owner team, you support them, whether it's building a community of practice within the product owner group itself, whether giving them whatever support they need through trainings, through interacting with the teams, through ambassador visits, could be all sorts of tricks, right? But make sure you give them all the support that they require. And then when you're choosing your product owners, right, make sure they understand what a product is. All right, so I think that pretty much covers what we have for you. So, um, any questions? We had some. Okay, yep. Okay. Okay, so one of the things to think about is remember that product owner is not a full-time role. Okay, it isn't, that's the, the myth that most people would um, believe in, actually. I think it's a full-time role. Your real product owners actually are busy people, very busy people. Um, the first thing to do is to really sit down with them and work out with them whether they truly understand the importance of that product ownership role. Um, they still, even though they are busy people, they still need to be actively engaged in the vision for their product 
and steering it, steering it in the direction that they want to release that product in. Because they're the ones who are out there, and the, you know, typically um, for most commercial organizations, um, your product is the thing you're selling out to your customer. And your product owners are the ones who are in touch with where they want to make their next move in terms of releasing out to market. So they understand, they should understand their vision. They understand the release roadmap they want to take. So therefore, they should be in touch with the order and priority they want things are doing in. Now, does a product owner have to turn up at each and every product backlog grooming event or, or PBR? No. If they are the expert in a particular aspect of your product, then yes. If not, um, good subject matter experts um, play the role of those uh, uh, of the um, individuals who are, who are providing that knowledge into the product, and that's who you're working with in order to flesh out the detail. The product owner has set the set the idea out there. He knows what he wants. He or she knows what they want, and now we can use other experts in the organisation to help build that understanding. But the product owner, at the end of the day, will still prioritise. That doesn't take that long to do out of their busy day. And I reckon, I think my colleague Tim and I have had a look at this, and if you tot up the amount of time a, a real product owner has to spend with a scrum team, it's probably, I don't know, Tim, what do you reckon? Yeah, 15% of their time? Yeah, that's about it. Yeah, I, I'll um, just so, add to that. So yeah. they, need to, they do need to understand what it means to be a product owner, yeah. though. So as she said, training is essential. So... Um, uh, uh, you know, not just the training, following it up intensively with coaching and helping them understand how they can manage that backlog without it becoming an onerous activity. Okay, they've still got, you know, they've got, they've got other experts in the organization who can provide the detail and fill in the gaps, um, but the ask is very clear on that backlog. We just need to now make it even more clear by using our experts, and that's how you free up the time. Because real product owners are busy. They're running the organisation, okay, and that's that's where the first stumbling block is. I absolutely relate to what you what you're saying. Yeah, and I think I'll just add to that that in this new model, uh, I heard this right. So agile teams will turn out crap very quickly if you don't guide them, right? So if your product owner is spending the money, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's both both uh, both sides need help and yeah. both sides need to come together to figure it out. The beauty, of course, of of uh, any uh, iterative incremental development framework is instant feedback and f fast feedback loops every couple of weeks. And and for a product owner, um, that is one essential meeting that they absolutely have to be at is that that sprint review because that's our instant feedback loop, then we can provide comfort in terms of, is the product moving in the right direction? Have we got it wrong? Did the product owner mess up in terms of his understanding of what his ask was, his or her ask? Yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, at the end of our session, um, the next session I think is going to be starting fairly shortly. Thank you so much for coming. Um, and hopefully we've just given you a few little thoughts to take away. We, I could talk about product ownership all day, every day. Um, it's one of the things I feel quite strongly about. Um, so feel free to catch us at any time. We've certainly learned a lot over the past year, yeah. um, and we learn every day. I learn every day about what it means to be a better product owner and how we can help our product owners steer and guide our teams to building fantastic software. Thank you. Thank you.